great to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, to prepare our hearts and minds as we get around the communion table this morning, I've selected uh, scripture from John 4, verses 7 through 12. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is God. And everyone that love is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth God, not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this <coughs> manifests the love of God toward us, because God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but He loved us and sent His Son to be the uh, perpetuation for our sins. Beloved, if God has so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. As the Lord's Supper celebrates a love that we cannot earn, Jesus' sacrifice is a gift, a gift that flows from God's grace, a love that we cannot learn. God's love in Christ must be experienced and lived out and performed each day. On the other hand, God's Supper celebrates the love that we must discern. The object of love must be recognized its source. We must discern his body, the body of Christ broken for us, and the Lord's Supper celebrates a love that we must return. Christian love is a mutual, is mutual and reciprocal. We love God because he first loved us. We loved others because we were once the other that God loved through Christ. The Lord's Supper is truly a feast of love. So today let us celebrate God's love, a love that cannot neither be earned but merely learned. Let us celebrate God's love, discerning the sources of his love, and return his love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we can assemble around your table so graciously prepared for us, that you loved us so much to send our Lord Jesus Christ to suffer and die on that cross in our stead and to hang there uh, in the shame, most shameful way to die. But in doing so, he replaced and took away our sins that we may have the hope of eternal life. As we partake of these emblems today, may we do so in a worthy manner and may each of us be uh, blessed and recognize your authority here on earth. And be with us today throughout the rest of the service and that what we say and do here, it is to your glory. Amen.
Roger is going to be doing our special this morning. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure it's going to be a good one. <laughs> well, we'll try it. Uh, Here we go. <clears throat> Ready? Mm -hmm. I hear the wind praise your goodness. Son on the hill shines more. 
see everybody here and of those of you who are joining us online it's, it's kind of an exciting day uh, but bittersweet all in the same we have made it through the book of Revelation um, it's been a long road I know that there, it's been 22 uh, chapters done in 18 weeks uh, and if you've missed any of those uh, all of those recordings are up uh, on the website and you can go to YouTube and watch those videos uh, but it's been a phenomenal walk through, um, you know, the book of Revelation. It, it's been exciting to go through it. Uh, I've learned an, ex, uh, an incredible amount. I, I hope you have uh, as well. But um, as it is the last chapter and has become pretty commonplace, we got a lot to go through today. So I'm going to go ahead and open us up with a word of prayer, and we are going to dive right in. So dearly, Father God, thank you for this morning. God, thank you for your word the life that is found there, the freedom that is found there, but God, also the, um, the responsibility that we find there. So God, I pray that as we walk through this last chapter of the book of Revelation, God, that your spirit would move openly and freely here today. God, every ear would be made ready to hear your message, every mind made ready to ex uh, understand that message, and every heart made ready to accept that message. So God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we've gone through um, 22 chapters, uh, I do not expect everyone to agree on everything that has been said, pointed out, or studied, uh, but I do expect everyone to agree on the main idea that was woven throughout the entire book, that is, the hope that is found in Jesus Christ for the believer and all those who would call him Lord. Right. Is there fire and brimstone littered throughout? Of course there is. We all know there is. That's really the only part of Revelation that most of us knew before we started this was the fire and the brimstone and just the destruction. And we didn't see all the grace and mercy and life. Uh, but uh, hopefully we've seen that on this side of it. And we have to remember that that fire and brimstone, that destruction, that overwhelming righteousness of God is reserved for those who oppose God, who willingly stand against the truth that is found in the gospel and Jesus Christ. For all those who, who know him, we see grace, we see hope, we see promises being fulfilled, and then we see this, this beautiful picture of grace being extended to everyone all the way up until the very end. But that's the, that, that's the thing, is that once the end has come, it's the end, right? It will be sooner than later in the scheme of the world. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people who say, well, one of these days, when the time is right, when I'm not busy, 
I'll make that decision. I'll talk about it. But here, here's the deal. If you're waiting for the right time, that right time is probably not going to come around according to your schedule. If you're waiting to when you're not busy, uh, let me know when that part of life rolls around because I'm excited to see that. Um, yet I don't know a single person in here that won't tell me, hey, I, I'm not busy. I ain't got nothing to do. No matter what our age is, we're always busy. There's always something. So as we get ready to dive all the way into chapter 22, I want, uh, I want everyone to lean in. All right, don't become complacent. It's the last chapter. Right, I'm going to check out. I'm just going to be here. Don't do that. Don't shortchange yourself. Pay attention as John describes this new garden of Eden that is promised to all those who belong to God. Because that's what we've been walking towards this whole time. That's what we as believers are looking forward to, isn't it? Right? We're looking forward to, to heaven with God, this new garden, this new earth, this, all this new creation. That's what we're excited for. That's where our hope is. So don't check out because, oh, well, I'll get there one day. Pay attention. Lean in. Let's see what uh, the first two verses have to say. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are the healing of the nations. So the first part uh, of John's vision of the city, right, the city to come, this new heaven, new garden of Eden, it deals with God's provision of water and food for his people. Now we've seen throughout uh, the Bible, if you go back through and you read I mean, all the way back in Genesis, all the way obviously here to the very end, God provides for his people. We're never truly without. Now you might be without some wants. You might be without some creature comforts from time to time. But most of us in this room, if not every single one of us in this room, and those who are joining online, have never prayed, God, give me today the bread I need, and actually needed him to provide food for us, because we have had plenty. Right? God is always providing, but there are those who desperately depend upon God, and we're seeing that that dependence is being fulfilled totally. There will be no more need or worry or hopes. Why hope next month? He says the fruit trees, they produce this crop every month. I was super excited when Jamie bought a peach tree to stick in our yard because I'm like, man, I'm going to get me some peaches soon. No one told me it was going to be like 10 years. So I've got a little stick with leaves on it that I hope one day produces peaches. I doubt it after this past year's garden. But anyways, anyways. But although human, uh, all the humans, right, we're denied access to the tree of life uh, back in, in the original sin in Genesis chapter 3, it's now freely available to all. The one thing that was, the one thing that was not allowed in the beginning is now free. Everyone's uh, allowed to it. The tree being on each side of the river. Right? Ezekiel had a vision of something very similar back in Ezekiel chapter 47. What this does is it shows that there is no wrong side of the river in heaven. Right? The tree produces a fresh crop of fruit each month, no matter what side you sit on, demonstrating God's constant provision for all. Look at verse 3. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through uh, water that was ankle deep. Uh, ever since the first sin in Genesis chapter 3, Right, humanity has been cursed because of Adam and Eve's rebellion against God. Now rebellion, sin, and the curse of that original rebellion. It's gone forever. Revelation gives a glimpse of this authentic worship. Look at verses 4 and 5. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. Right? The human uh, nature, right? we fear uh, death, and the seeing of, of God will be removed in this uh, new garden. God's people will bear his name and will see his face with the utmost joy. John says that they will reign with God forever in his radiant light that, that banishes night, right? The need for lamps, 
We talked about this a lot last week with the fact that since uh, we will be in the presence of God and Jesus, there is no more need for the sun or moon or, or lamps to give us light. We will be in the presence of the light. Right, this next section, verses uh, 6 through 21, includes an epilogue that contains utterances by an angel. Uh, it, c it contains utterances from Christ himself and then a concluding plea for Christ's return and a closing benediction, uh, which means when someone offers a blessing. The epilogue has several direct verbal uh, connections with the introduction of the book. Right, the end is going to take us all the way back to the beginning. It sums up the important themes such as encouraging the faithful to, be, uh, you know, to persevere through the hardships that are guaranteed to come. I can promise you, I can guarantee you, you will face hardships in this life because of your faith in Christ. But you persevere through those things because the promise of tomorrow is greater than whatever you can face today. And we have hope in that. Right? And then it warns all those evildoers. It affirms the authenticity of the prophetic messages uh, found throughout the Old Testament and restating the eminence, the importance, the nearness of Christ's return. So look at verse 6. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that most, uh, must soon take place. So everything that John records in Revelation is trustworthy and true uh, because, well, because of God. Right, who has all authority. He has sent these messengers. He has revealed these visions to John through Jesus and through angels. But it does not mean that these visions are easy to understand. Right? Raise your hand if you've understood every part of Revelation so far. <laughs> well, I wouldn't expect people to laugh. But yeah, no, we'd, we'd, we didn't understand all the pieces of Revelation. And I think that's something that we can all agree on. Like, we're not all going to understand. We're not all going to agree on every little bit and piece. If it was easy to understand, we would all be experts in the book uh, of Revelation, and there wouldn't be countless commentaries written about the book and its application. There are sections of this book that when you read through the letter, this, this Revelation from John, you can read as much as you want, and you will find different uh, opinions, an application based on someone's view of this or that. Countless. The parts of it you could swim through commentaries. We're not going to all understand every little bit of this. And that is okay. Why do you think that's okay? Because we know, we have hope, and we have trust and faith in God that he is going to reveal these things when it's appropriate. And that appropriate time may be the end where all of a sudden you stand before God. And in that moment... When you stand before the creator of all things, do you think you're going to care about the minutia found in Revelation chapter 13 was a good one? No. We're not going to care. You're going to be in the presence of God. So, you know, it's, it's okay to not understand every little bit in peace. Look at verse 7. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. Now, the sixth blessing of Revelation is for those who obey. Obedience is key to God's blessing. Right? Obedience is key to God's blessing. I think it's super interesting and just as important to, to make note of the fact that this first declaration of the imminent coming of Jesus, right, is from Jesus. Look, I am coming soon. This, hey, the end is near. You better be on your toes. I am coming soon. Right? And this is a declaration from Jesus uh, in response to the yearnings of the church that we've seen. It's the sixth beatitude in Revelation. And like the first one uh, found in chapter 1, it is dedicated and directed toward those who keep or obey the words of the prophecy. He tells us right there. Blessed is the one who what? Keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. The six blessings of Revelation that we've seen so far can be found chapter 1, chapter 14, chapter 16, chapter 19, 
chapter 20, and then here in chapter 22. Now look at verses 8 and 9. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of the scroll. Worship God. Now the early warning against false worship uh, that we see here is actually in chapter 19 where the same thing happens. He falls at the feet of an angel to worship and the angel says the same thing. Stop. Don't do that. Don't worship me. I'm only a servant. Worship God. Right? Only God deserves our worship. Nothing else. Nothing else deserves our worship. God has made it abundantly clear throughout his word that he is the only one that is deserving of our worship. Now there are many things in this world that yearn for your worship, but you must remain vigilant against the things of this world that want your worship. The things of this world that say, hey, focus on me. Pay attention to me. Look at the things I can do for you. You've got to stay aware and vigilant against those. Some of those things uh, that we, mankind, right, tend to worship, money. Things, like just things that you have around, relationships, sports. Right, the list can go on and on and on. Only God is worthy of of our worship. There is no but there. Look at verse 10. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the time is near. So in verse 10, the angel expands on John's initial instruction to write in a book and warns against the curtailing or reduction, the, the reducing in the meaning that is being communicated in this revelation from Jesus. It's easy to ignore the book of Revelation from a teaching perspective because it's a hard book to teach. I can guarantee you I have stepped on toes throughout this series because it's not something that we've ever learned before. It's not what's been taught before. I don't really like that because that makes me uncomfortable. I don't want to have to think about going through that because I don't want to go through that. Like, I get it. It's extremely difficult, not only to teach, but how many of you have actually spent real time in the book of Revelation before this series? Let alone how many of you have actually spent time reading the book of Revelation through this series? Or have we just waited until Sunday morning to let me tell you about it? I'm guilty, just as everybody else. To do it correctly, right? To spend time in the book of Revelation, to spend time in any part of God's Word. It takes a lot of time and energy. It takes weeks to get through, um, obviously 18 weeks for us to get through this. It makes people uncomfortable. We don't like to feel uncomfortable. If you've not felt uncomfortable at times in this series, you have not been paying attention. <laughs> right? Although some of the things that John saw, he was instructed to keep sealed. We've seen this uh, God does not reveal everything for his reasons. But what has been revealed, what he has shown us throughout this book, must be communicated so that people will understand the gravity, the seriousness of the message, and the fact that the time is near. Now, I have been asked a lot over the last four and a half months if we are indeed in the end times. The simple answer is yes. Since the moment Jesus defeated death, rose from the grave, guaranteed our salvation for all those who believe in him, we have been living in the end times. Now is the time going to end soon? I have no idea. Neither does anyone else. But we're warned throughout this book, this revelation from Jesus to be what? Prepared. To make sure that we're following God, that we have repented of our sins, to be obedient to the things written in God's word, especially in this scroll. Look at verse 11. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. Now verse 11 appears... Uh, 
at first reading, to, like the first time we look at this, kind of fatalistic. Right? Let those who do wrong do wrong. Let those who are vile be vile. If you do right, do right. If you are holy, be holy. But if you look at it, this exhortation, what, what it means is emphatically, right? He's emphatically urging someone to do something. This, this urging from the angel stresses the immediacy, the importance of the return of Jesus and the necessity for immediate choices. This is not one of those make this choice later when the time is convenient. If you're going to do wrong, do wrong. If you're going to be vile, be vile. If you're going to do right, do right. It's this idea that your choices matter. You don't always have tomorrow. Right? We have uh, what we've done in modern times. Uh, is kind of the way that an application for this. All right? And hear me as gently as I possibly can come across uh, with this. Uh, one of the ways that I, I've seen us kind of living in this, I'm going to do it on my time when it's comfortable for me. And I'm, again, I'm guilty of this uh, w when I made the decision. But it's when we decide to follow Jesus, it's become more of a spectacle than it should be. When we decide to follow Jesus, right, we want to wait until the right time. I did. I waited. Uh, I waited like almost two full weeks to make sure I could have uh, my family there and my, my, one of my best friends that I grew up with that was a Christian. Uh, we didn't grow up to, as Christians together, but I was making that decision. I wanted everybody to be there to celebrate that moment with me. Was that, is that wrong? No. But I was making something out of it that it wasn't intended to be. Right? And before we complete this journey, right, this, from Gentile to follower of Jesus, we've we got to make sure it's done our way. This is not what we see in Scripture. Look at Acts chapter 8, verses 35 through 38. Then Philip opened his mouth, and, and beginning with the Scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. He's talking to the, Philip, uh, the, the Ethiopian eunuch. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. This moment of following Jesus is that immediacy that I was talking about earlier. If you're doing right, do right. Holy, do holy. Wrong, do wrong. Our choices matter. The time we make these choices, it matters. It can't always wait to fit your schedule. When God moves, don't stand in the way. All right, back to chapter uh, 22, verse 11. Far from being an encouragement to remain apathetic, right, this idea of just, you just do you, it'll all be okay. Right, this, this verse, it's evangelistic in spirit. It may also hint uh, at the great ordeal that John viewed as imminent. For the unfaithful and the wicked, this appeal would be a deep confirmation of their choices. Whereas to the faithful, it would alert them to the necessity of guarding themselves against spiritual laziness that leads to unrighteousness. Right? If you're doing wrong, do wrong. If you're doing vile, do vile. If you're doing right, do right. Be holy, be holy. There is zero reason to take this passage as teaching the irreversibility of human choices. What I mean by that is saying that Jesus can't come in in that last moment and change someone's heart. That is not what this means. This is talking to you. This is talking to us. Your choices matter. The immediacy of your choices, it is important. Repentance is always an option if a person is living. After death, there remains only judgment, no repentance. That's a, that's a hard thing, isn't it? Like we want to say, oh, no, we understand that, but the reality of that, let it sink in for a moment. Repentance is always an option for the living, but once you have passed from this world, there is no more option. Your choice has been made. Do right what is right. Do wrong what is wrong. Look at verses 12 and 13. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. 
Now the second of three announcements of the imminent return of Jesus uh, found in this chapter is associated with the truth of rewards and judgment based on deeds. This isn't my interpretation, that's what Jesus just said. Right, so unfortunately, not every statement of belief is genuine. Faith will show itself in our actions. We are indeed saved uh, by the grace and power of God and in God alone and our faith in Christ. Our works do not save us. Your works, no matter how noble they may be, do not save you. But they do indicate the seriousness of our confession and provide a basis for our ultimate reward or punishment. Right? Our faith will bring us into seasons of good works. James talks about it, you know, show me a faith without works, I'll show you a faith that is dead. Paul talks about you have been saved by faith and faith alone, not in your works, so that no one man may boast. Remember what the next verse says? So that you can do the things that God has put before you. Your faith will bring you to good works. Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, right? We'd be able to see, someone says, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus with everything, and their life doesn't reflect that. Well, that's not for us to make that decision. Just hope, make sure everybody knows that. But your deeds, your actions speak volumes for your profession. If you profess faith in Christ and you are not active, there is a warning in that. Look at verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they uh, may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Uh, the seventh and last beatitude, the blessing here in Revelation, is evangelistic in emphasis. So uh, strands of the earlier imagery are, are blended in this verse as we've seen some things uh, throughout the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, the washing of robes indicated a, a willing identification with Jesus in his death. So the followers would wash these robes indicating they belonged to Jesus. It also carries the thought of martyrdom that during the great ordeal uh, for the saints found in chapter 6. The washing of robes symbolizes a salvation that involves obedience and discipleship since it is integrally, right, it is integrated, it is, they're, they're part of each other, related to the salvation imagery of the tree of life and the gates of the city. Those who have been purified by trusting in Christ and following him faithfully will be the ones who enter in the gates of the city. Look at verse 15. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So this verse again lists those who are not admitted to contrast right, with those who are being admitted. The ones being admitted are holy, the righteous, they've died to those selfish, uh, the selfish pleasures and, and they put God first versus those who are idolaters, murderers, the immoral, right? These unrepentant sinners remain outside the city. It's another warning. Here we're seeing grace and mercy, even in the warnings. If God didn't care, do you think he'd be warning them? Everybody shake your heads left and right. No. <laughs> it's grace. Even in the warnings, even in the hard, there's grace. Right, this warning to those who do not repent that they will not be allowed into the city of God. They will not be allowed to enter into this city because they will be thrown into the lake of fire. Again, the result of unfaithfulness is eternal death. It's finite. There is no coming back. Look at verse 16. I, Jesus have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And in this verse, uh, Jesus addresses John and the churches directly. So he's talking to us. The you in verse 16 is plural in the Greek text. It's not just you, it means y'all. <laughs> Jesus didn't say y'all. It would have made more sense sometimes. But he's saying you, it means all those. 
Right here, Christ's words authenticate the whole book of Revelation. He just said, I, Jesus, I don't know if you can get more credit than that, have sent the angel, right, have sent you this testimony. It has come from me. Right, when he says this testimony, it, it, this is being the message for the churches. Jesus is saying, this message is from me to you. Therefore, right, any method of interpreting revelation that blunts, that softens the application of this message in its entirety to the present church must be disregarded because it disregards the words of Jesus. He is the Messiah of Israel, which is the root and the offering of David. Right? This is an image of marriage from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. We see Isaiah chapter 11 and then actually in Revelation chapter 5. Right? It's this fulfillment of the promise to overcomers. He's saying, I am the root. Everything will come from me. Verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes uh, take the free gift of the water of life. The first two sentences in this verse um, are not evangelistic appeal, but express the yearning of the Holy Spirit and the bride for Christ's return. Right? How many times have we prayed, Lord God, we want you to come back now? Right? This is the yearning of the church to come. Those who hear, the members of the local congregation and John's time in this invitation for Christ's return. Then in any of the congregations who are not yet followers of Jesus are invited to come and take the water of life. This Doria, it's this free gift that comes from God. It's, you cannot be found anywhere else. And it's free. Go to verses 18 and 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. So this is talking to us. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. If you have not heard any other warning, any time in your time in church, hear this one. To take away from God's word is a bad deal. To soften, because we don't want to offend, we don't want to upset, we don't want to hurt someone's feelings, take warning. God does not deal with those things well. So John issues an oath to protect the integrity of the book of Revelation. Right? He declares a curse upon anyone who alters the contents of the book and its message. This curse is in contrast with the statement of blessing on all those who read aloud, listen to, and obey the prophecy. So why do you think he would voice this curse? Right? If he talks about all those who would read it aloud will be blessed, and all those who heard it being read aloud, you will be blessed. But then here at the end, he gives this very strong curse. But at the time that Revelation was written, scribes would sometimes alter books to suit their own views. Does this sound like anything that might happen today? Well, here's what's being said, and well, you know, I, I mean, I, I kind of see that, but I'm going to move some things around and I'm going to say this. Early Christians quickly developed means of authenticating both messages and the messengers. Uh, since the time of the early church, the scope and content of the New Testament has been established as the measure of Christian proclamation, meaning what we find in Scripture is what we proclaim. We don't add to, we do not take away. That is our standard. Yet the church continues to be plagued by those who would attempt to reconstruct Scripture by adding other works that they believe are equal to uh, the Bible, or by arguing that certain segments of the Bible are, are really they're un, they're unreliable creations of human efforts or human perceptions to, to, to get this done or that done. The genuine church has rejected and will continue to reject efforts 
to redefine the boundaries of Scripture by human or even demonic attempts to alter the basis of the Christian faith. As Christians, we will stand firm on the Word of God. That's it. We're not going to add to nothing written by anyone else since then is equal to the Word of God. Everything falls beneath it. Look at verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This is the third affirmation of Jesus' imminent return being given by Jesus himself. Again, yes, I am coming soon. John responds to Jesus' declaration by saying, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Right, the excitement there, this fervent words are part of the, the, the liturgy of the early church. Right, a nerdy side note, just so you understand where I'm coming from. Oscar Coleman believes that these words are the earliest expression of the res uh, recognition that the Lord's Day, Sunday, is the day of the resurrection. Right, as Jesus appeared to his disciples alive on the first day of the Jewish week, which is Sunday, uh, so he was expected to be present on the Spirit at every first day celebration and to appear again at the end, which is often represented by the picture of the Messianic meal. The expression, come Lord Jesus, is equivalent to the, Ara uh, the Aramaic phrase, uh, excuse me, come O Lord, uh, and it's uh, Maranatha. Right, come O Lord. Verse 21. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. So a conclusion like this, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty unusual for a Jewish apocalyptic message, but it's completely appropriate uh, for this prophetic message addressed to the ancient church and indeed the whole body of Christ throughout eternity. The benediction or blessing is reminiscent of Paul's usual practice. He always ends with that blessing. Whether in this blessing... We should you know, accept the textual reading as with all or with all the saints. So your different translations are going to say, uh, these, they all kind of split here between these two, with all or with all the saints. Uh, you know, the NIV says with God's people. Uh, you know, there are arguments about it. Does it mean everybody, all the saints? Uh, well, however you end up, the meaning is still there. Uh, the things theologians argue about sometimes is, is pretty ridiculous. Whether it's with, with all or with all, the saints are all God's people. Well, those are all three the same thing. Right? They all lead to the same place. So you've got to be careful when you go to do the search on your own to study and not get lost in the minutia of arguments because we love to argue, don't we? Even though we don't sometimes agree on the specific meaning of a verse or the way a translation says one thing versus the other, or this is the way my favorite translation says it, what we can agree on is that nothing less than God's grace is required for us to be overcomers and triumphantly enter into the holy city of God, where we shall reign with him forever and ever. And all of God's people say, Well, all of God's people who were awake said amen. So there's been an obvious, but a lot of times overlooked, theme throughout the entire Bible, but especially the book of Revelation, that is key to our understanding of God's holy word, obedience. Now you can go from the very beginning of Genesis all the way to the very end. Obedience is themed through all. It is found in every book. It's found in every single chapter. It is always there. Obedience to God. So I want you to say it with me and everyone this time. Obedience. Obedience. Try it one more time. Count of three. One, two, three. Obedience. Obedience. There, that's beautiful. We'll edit all the rest out. Um, but obeying God means moving aside. Right, putting our wants on the back burner sometimes and allowing God, allowing His Word, His Holy Spirit, His way of operating to move in our lives. It will call us to bright new things that are just sometimes downright scary. But we must be obedient to God and His calling. 
It means having faith that he will be true to his word. Right? When we obey, we don't try to control our lives or the situations around us by our own strength. When you do that, you may win a time or two. But when you fail, boy, you fail. And it's hard to get up. Instead, right, we focus on God by keeping him and his word at the forefront of our minds and allowing him to have his way and trusting that he will fulfill his promises. We cannot claim to love God without obeying God. So I want to challenge uh, all of us today. I want to challenge you to commit to obeying him right now not tomorrow or when it's comfortable or convenient, right now in every area of your life. Not just the places that you're good at. Not just the places that you want. But even those places you don't want. I want to challenge you to be obedient. We serve a big God. Right? He's magnificent. He's awe-inspiring. And we should obey Him immediately and wholeheartedly so we can walk with Him closely and enjoy the benefits of His presence in our life. If you want to find joy, and I mean real joy in life, be obedient. Put yourself at the foot of the cross. Do what God calls you to do. But I want to end our series, the book of Revelation, with a quote that is a warning to all those who hear this message and have not yet put your faith in Jesus. The quote is not meant to belittle or guilt you into starting your faith journey. It is, sim it is the simplest summarization of the entirety of the book of Revelation that I could find, and it was so much better than anything I could come up with on my own. It's from Tom Thomas Akempis. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Like if you don't write anything else down, you, you don't take anything away, delayed obedience is disobedience. You are called to obey God now not tomorrow. All right, we've learned from Jesus in this revelation that disobedience equals eternal damnation. But obedience leads to eternal salvation. All right, put your faith and trust in Jesus today. In a moment, we're going, to, uh, we're going to exit on song. We're going to worship God for who he is. And I want to encourage you to truly do that. Um, one of the beautiful parts about getting to stand in the back and stand outside to greet people as I can actually hear you singing um, out there. And you guys were amazing this morning. It was beautiful to hear the voices rising above the music. So I'm going to challenge you, and I know Twyla loves it too. We want to hear you sing. Worship God for who he is. So before we get there, let me close this with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for today. God, thank you for your revelation that you gave John. The call to absolute obedience on all those who belong to you, God. Not only for our own sake, but for the influence on those around us. God, I pray that you would surround us so with the lost that we could not help but to share your grace, God, your mercy, your love, and your truth with all those who yet do not know you. So that one day they may be entered into the kingdom of God. They may be welcomed home with that phrase that we all hope to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So God, I pray a special blessing on all those here today, those who are watching online, and those who couldn't join us. God, I pray that you give each one of us the energy to continue to be um, your light in our world. God, give us the courage to be bold and humble all in the same breath. God, we thank you. We love you. It's in the most powerful and precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen.